When people think of living plant collections, the image of plants in pots often springs to mind. But living collections are more than just nurseries. So there's living collection holdings, and that's holding threatened species as living collections in gardens or in pots. There's, there's holding material for research purposes and you know, understanding the environmental tolerances of a species. There's growing plants with the view to put them back into the wild, so recovery programs. There's a really important role for public gardens uh, and botanic gardens to actually tell conservation stories through living collections. These living collections differ from standard nurseries or even collections used for restoration because individual plants are often tracked to maintain their unique genotype and ensure that genetic diversity isn't lost. Plants in living collections are propagated in three main ways. Seed, vegetative or specialist methods like micropropagation or tissue culture. Storage and propagation from seed is cheaper and requires less space, but there are limitations. It takes longer, especially if dormancy needs to be alleviated. You don't know the exact genetics of the plants, and some species produce limited seed, no viable seed, or even no seed at all. Vegetative reproduction then becomes a cheap and often reliable method to produce large numbers of plants. It could be growing from cuttings, grafting, layering. So there's aerial layering, below ground layering, division. And that could be from um, dividing rhizomes, etc. It could be stem cuttings or um, stolen cuttings from rhizomatous plant material. Vegetative propagation relies on totipotency, the ability of the plant to regenerate using unspecialised cells in roots shoots, rhizomes and leaves. Vegetative propagation produces clones, which is a good way to maintain a nursery population that genetically represents the wild populations. Cultures are hardened off, grown on, and then grown on into containers and reintroduced into the nursery. But with threatened species, nothing is straightforward and often different propagation methods are trialled. One of the most common and often first tried is semi-hardwood cuttings collected in spring or autumn. A tutorial on this method is included as a separate video in the series. Propagation and maintenance of threatened plants in the nursery also offers a rare chance to learn about the biology of a species, including which ones have specific mycorrhizal relationships, or which require extreme growing conditions like acidity, water logging, or mimicking high humidity, such as occurs in a cloud forest. So the collection behind me here is a collection of the endemic taxa from uh, eight or nine far north Queensland peaks. The, these peaks, they're, they're cloud forests, and all the climate modelling is suggesting that these peaks will get hotter and drier. Yet there's, you know, 70, 80, endemic species that only occur on these peaks that occur no one else on planet Earth. So what we've established here as a part of this consortium is a, an ex situ conservation collection. Learning how to propagate species in this collection has taught the team about plant growing conditions and in some cases they've been surprised at unexpected tolerances. You know the assumption is that if it comes from a narrow ecological niche it might have a narrow set of environmental tolerances but we're finding out with a, a couple of examples, there's a Prumnopites, uh, which we've been cultivating in the garden for a good number of years. It's tolerating 40 degrees and low relative humidity, yet it's one of these things that come from the mountain peaks. So it, its environmental tolerances are much, much wider than what you might think. Some threatened plants are extremely susceptible to disease and living collections give a great controlled opportunity to test potential treatments. But living collections do have downsides. The amount, amount of record keeping, the, the human resources result, required for actually conserving the material, etc., are really quite high. So it can be problematic to actually get sufficient funding and the resources to actually manage a collection. 
That is why collaborations are becoming more important. The aim for this collection is, is to not hold it just here, it's to hold it here and in a, a good number of other botanic gardens up and down the eastern seaboard. And that's referred to as a meta collection, so multi-site conservation collection, which is bringing in a, a number of different agencies. The, the idea there is that if a particular plant in, in our collection here died, and that's what happens in living collections, there's a sort of a backstop population. So yeah, having conservation holdings not just held in one location is a really legitimate thing, and it's starting to happen a lot more in botanic garden worlds. There is no simple single method for best practice ex situ conservation. The nursery plays a key role in getting plant species into storage, then at the right time, getting them out of storage and regenerating germplasm into healthy living plants. It takes a suite of specialist skills and resources to conserve our unique threatened flora. More information about ex situ conservation methods is included in Chapter 8 of the Guidelines. Chapter 11 also covers all the different types of living collections you may encounter to conserve our national planet.